Hi, Pastor Rob here. Just wanted to say thank you for all of your love and support here at the Bridge Church. I know many of you are visiting our website right now to maybe catch up on some sermons over the past weeks, or uh, maybe some of you are checking us out for the very first time, and we would just want to do everything we can to help you connect with God. Here at the Bridge Church, we believe it's our job to do exactly that. Connect people to God, and the best way we can do that is by connecting with you. So uh, we just wanted to let you know before you watch this message today, uh, our hope is that you would find your own faith community where wherever you're at, whether that be here in our corner of Northeast Iowa, maybe you can connect with us, uh, or, or wherever else you may be. Uh, connecting to a community is vitally important to your spiritual growth. So as happy as we are that you're using our online resources, our prayer and our hope is that you're able to find a faith community of your own, that you might be able to learn and grow and, and build yourself up spiritually and have others do that for you as well. So if, you, uh, if, if you're watching this for the very first time, uh, we pray that you're encouraged. We pray that, we pray that you're built up in, in your faith. And, uh, and we pray that you do exactly as the Apostle Paul has called you to do in the book of Hebrews, and that is to not give up meaning together. Thank you so much, and God bless. Once again, for those of you that are new with us, my name is Rob Williams, and uh, I'm the lead pastor here at The Bridge, and it's such a privilege to have you here with us today. If you're new with us, we are so absolutely glad you're here. Um, if I haven't had a chance to meet you, please come on, say hi to me after service. We want to get to know you. Um, we want to do everything we can to connect everyone to God, and the best way we can do that is by connecting with you. But um, uh, we've got a couple new babies in the house this morning. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know if you guys, for those of you that are new with us, our associate pastor Joe and his wife just had a baby, and uh, Rhett Lyle, he's doing really good, and then we got Marcy and Ryan Ross sitting in the back with Finn, and uh, man, I am getting me some baby snuggles later, so can we just give them a hand, that's awesome. I'll tell you what, man, there's more than one way to grow a church, and that way's a lot more fun. Anyways... Uh, this morning we're kicking off uh, this new series called Hashtag Jesus. How many of you know what a hashtag is? Raise your hand. How many of you have no clue what a hashtag is? Raise your hand. Okay, so everybody 30 and older has no idea. Okay, so those of you that are 30 and younger, you can just tune out for a minute here, okay? We're going to talk about what a hashtag is for people that don't know what that is, because that's what this whole series is going to be based on, okay? A hashtag is otherwise known as a... Pound sign. Yeah, somebody said it. It's otherwise known as a pound sign. And it's, it's something that, you know, these youngins today, you know, that, that, that are on social media, we use uh, this thing that we call a hashtag, otherwise known as a pound sign. We use it to uh, uh, essentially tag the end of a social media post on Facebook or Twitter or, or Facebook or Instagram or whatever it might be. And, and we do, and the reason that we put these little tags at the end of our posts is because we want them to become trending topics, okay? We want them to become trending topics. The, the, the cool thing about using a hashtag is, is that when you put a hashtag at the end of something, what you can do is you can actually go on Google and type in that hashtag, and it'll show all of the social media posts under that hashtag, okay? So um, uh, one show that I love to watch is The Late Night Show with Jimmy Fallon. Anybody watch that? Raise your hand. Okay, he does this awesome bit called hashtags, and, and it's every Wednesday night, and, and he basically gives them a hashtag hashtag to put the end of a Twitter post or a social media post, and then they collect the best ones, and then they read them on the show, okay? And, and what ends up happening a lot of times when they do that is uh, it becomes a worldwide trending topic, okay? It just, it happens quite frequently on that show. And so just to give you a little bit more of a, a definition of what this thing is, and then I'll give you some examples, is, uh, the, the, is when you go to Google and you define the purpose of a hashtag, you find this. It says, it's a symbol to identify a keyword, word excuse me, keyword, keyword or topic of interest to facilitate a search for it, okay? So that's the whole point of a hashtag. Um, and some of the most trending topics in the world have been discovered or made popular through hashtags. And as I thought about that this week, and as, I, as we were putting this series together the last few weeks, we thought to ourselves, man, what would it mean for us as Christians to make Jesus the most trending topic in the world? Like, how awesome would that be? Right? Going back to Jimmy Fallon, Jimmy Fallon, when he does his, his trending topics or when he tries to do his hashtag bits, he always comes up with something like funny or sarcastic. Like some of, sometimes they'll do hashtag my worst date, 
okay? Or they'll do hashtag parent, or they'll do hashtag dad quotes, right? Or hashtag mom quotes, or, or uh, I think there was my worst uh, awkward, uh, awkward moment, hashtag awkward moment. And people will give a social media post about an awkward moment and put hashtag at the end of it, and they'll collect all these and share them on the show. Well, I was going to show a Jimmy Fallon bit this morning, but he kind of gets a little crass. I look for like through like 10 or 15 videos, and there's always one bad joke that's just too far. So we're just going to go through these together, okay? I, I just decided I'm just going to take some of my own, and we're going to go through them together, all right? And, and I'll be the comedic relief. Okay, just fake it till you make it, all right? I get it, all right? Just fake it till you make it. But we're going to go through these. We, I've got, I picked out a hashtag that was hashtag parent fail. And I thought this was per, completely and totally appropriate because we got lots of ladies having babies, okay? And, and, and I specifically thought of Joe and thought, I thought about doing like hashtag dad jokes, but Joe's already got that on lock, okay? Because he's about as, as corny and punny as it gets, okay? If you've ever hung out with Joe, you'll understand. So we're just going to do hashtag parent fail just to encourage you new parents, hey, we all mess up, okay? And guess what? You're going to mess up. Oh, yes, you is, and I'm going to laugh when you do it. Okay, uh, hashtag parent fail. Let's go through a couple of these. Here's one. The guard fell off the clippers when my mom was cutting my hair, so she filled in the bald spot with a magic marker. Hashtag parent, parent fail. That wouldn't work with me. I got blonde hair. I don't know about you. Here's another one. Uh, my dad told me the ice cream truck played music when the ice cream was gone. <laughs> That's a parent win, all right? I'm just, what are you talking about, parent fail? That's genius. I need that guy's number. Uh, here's one that could easily happen to me with as many kids as I got. I put sunscreen on my four kids, but one of them came back burnt. Turns out I lathered up one kid twice. <laughs> I looked at my wife during first service because she was sitting in the front row and she just started nodding. She's like, yep, we've done that before. Okay, this one's, this, one's pretty, this one's pretty good. When I asked about the kittens our neighbor's cat had, my mom began to explain the birds and the bees. All I wanted was a kitten. I just wanted a kitten, mom. I don't want to hear about this. I haven't had to have that conversation with my kids yet. I'm dreading that day, so... Couple more here. Uh, I forgot to fill the pinata with candy at my daughter's birthday party. <laughs> Parent fail. <laughs> Woo! Man, would you like feel like the worst person on the planet? Oh my gosh. Here's another one. I didn't know my dad shaved his mustache off, so when he came to pick me up for first grade, I thought I was being abducted. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! The trauma. Uh, oh, the trauma. PTSD from that one, that's for sure. <laughs> All right, I got one more. One more and then we're done. My dad was a horrible speller. One, Christian, one Christmas, my sister got a present from Satan. <laughs> Man. Here's what's awkward. What happened if that gift was awesome? Like, <laughs> Man, Satan's awesome. All right, all right. Well, as we've kind of dug into the series, as we dig into the series, um, and as I was putting it together the last few weeks, um, I, I've really been asking myself, man, what would it look like uh, for us as Christians to make Jesus the number one topic in our lives? Like, what would that take, right? Because we want Jesus to be the number one trending topic, don't we? Amen? I mean, as Christians, Jesus should be the first and the last thing that we're known for. Whenever I, someone approaches me that's single and says, hey, I, I'm going out, of, you know, I've been dating this guy and it's been going really well, or I've been dating this girl, it's been going really well. The first question I always ask them, and, and they hate me for it every time, is do they love Jesus? Do they love Jesus? And, uh, and, and if I get anything other than yes, they do, absolutely, um, then I tell them, if you don't know, then they probably don't. Because if Jesus is the number one trending topic in your life, everybody knows it, amen? Everybody should know it. It should overflow from everything that you are. It should come out of your heart, your soul, your mind, your spirit, your mouth, your lips. Every single thing that you are and everything that God's called you to should proclaim the name of Jesus, amen? That's our job as Christians. Unfortunately, though, we're known for a lot of other things as Christians rather than Jesus, 
Unfortunately, a lot of Christians, specifically here in North American culture, a lot of Christians are known for our political biases instead of Jesus. A lot of Christians are, are known for our moral stances rather than Jesus. A lot of churches are known for their rock and worship teams or their, their great inspirational messages on Sunday morning rather than Jesus. We should be known for knowing, loving, and modeling Christ, shouldn't we? If we would claim to follow Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, as to say, if we would claim to say, he is the master and commander of my life, then we should be known for that. If only it were as easy as a hashtag. If only it were as easy as sharing a Facebook post or, or you know, putting a totally Instagrammable moment on social media. Making Jesus the number one trending topic in our lives takes a little bit more than that, doesn't it? I think one of the biggest problems, at least within North American Christianity, is that we're afraid of that moniker a little bit, aren't we? Maybe, maybe you're here today and you're afraid of being grouped in with Christianity because of the bad publicity it's gotten lately. I mean, think about it. What's going on with the Catholic Church? And you're sitting here going, oh, I don't want to be grouped in with those people. Or maybe you think about the fact that a lot of Christians are wrongly being uh, grouped in with a lot of bigots and racists and other horrible people. And you're like, I don't, I don't want to be grouped in with those people. I don't want to be judged for that. I don't want to be known for those things. And, and, and quite honestly, I, I don't blame you. But then maybe for some of us, maybe for some of us, it's just that we don't want to be the crazy Christian guy. Or we don't want to have the moniker of the crazy Christian lady. I don't know what it is for you. I don't know what, what, what keeps us from, from stepping into that, that, hey, Jesus is the one and only for me. But, but I, my goal throughout the series is to say, hey, if we're going to really say that Jesus is our Savior, then we have to make him the number one trending topic in our lives. And it should be done in such a way that every single person that knows us says, man, I don't know what it is about that guy, but he's just crazy about Jesus. He won't stop talking about him. I don't know what it is about that girl, but she's just got some joy in her that just seems otherworldly, and I don't know where it comes from. I know she talks about Jesus a lot. Man, there's something different about that church down on South Main Street. They are just on fire for Jesus Christ. And they have something that it doesn't seem like anybody else in this town has. And I want that. So how do we, how do, we do that? How do we, how, how do we make Jesus the number one trending topic in our life? As, as hard as it may, may seem, following Jesus is, the number, is worth every, every ounce of your effort. And, and we need to ask ourselves, what can we do to make him the number one trending topic in our lives. So throughout this series, we're going to be studying the life of Jesus leading up into Easter, okay? We're going to be studying the life of Jesus and moving in that direction, and we're going to look at specific instances, specifically within the book of John, okay? We're going to be in the book of John throughout this whole series where we see people doing exactly that, making Jesus the number one trending topic in their life, or where we see Jesus teaching us how to do exactly that. And today, we're going to kick things off right in John chapter 1. So if you have your Bibles with you, Go ahead and grab them now. If you don't have a Bible with you or you don't have an app for that, I'd encourage you to grab one of those black Bibles in the chair racks in front of you. Uh, here at the bridge, we make it a, a, a very strong effort to get in the Word every week. Um, we try not to put the passage of Scripture on the screen because we want you digging in with us. So the book of John, if you don't know how to get there, go to about two-thirds to three-quarters of the way near the back of your Bible. And you'll probably land in Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. If you've hit Acts or Romans... You've gone too far, all right? You've gone too far. So we're going to be in John chapter 1. And to give you some context, today we're going to be focusing on a man that was born for a very specific purpose in time, okay? To say that this man was uh, pretty different from the rest would be an understatement. One pastor actually described this man as a uh, Jesus' honey-chugging, bug-munching, Jedi-robe-wearing, rural homeschool prophet cousin. Most importantly, though, this man was ordained by God to be the one to come before Christ in order that he might announce his arrival and prepare the way. One commentary writes that this man was just like Jesus' herald. 
In ancient times, a herald or a forerunner would go before a dignitary to announce his coming or clear the way for him. And then the, the herald that we're going to be talking about to, today, it goes by the name of John the Baptist. John the Baptist. And as we're about to read, he knew exactly what it was going to take to lay down a foundation and make Jesus the trending topic of his day. So let's pick things up right in verse 19. That's where we're going to start. Now this was John's testimony when the Jewish leader, this was John's testimony when the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him who he was. He did not fail to confess, but confessed freely. I'm not the Messiah. They asked him, then who are you? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Well, then are you the prophet? He answered, no. Finally, they said, who are you? Give us an answer to take back to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? John replied in the words of Isaiah the prophet, I am the voice of one calling out in the wilderness. Make straight the way for the Lord. Now the Pharisees who had been sent questioned him, why then do you baptize if you are not the Messiah, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? John answered, I baptize with water. But, you, but among you stands one who you do not know. He is the one who comes after me, the straps of whose sandals I'm not even worthy to untie. This all happened at Bethany on the other side of the Jordan where John was baptizing. Now, what's crazy here and what many of you may not know is that throughout this whole passage, it's just absolutely packed with Old Testament prophecy. This, this passage of scripture is absolutely and totally packed with, 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 with Old Testament prophecy. The passage begins with the priests and the religious leaders um, of that time asking John about these prophecies. As a matter of fact, he senses them getting ready to do this. So immediately right off the bat, he says, listen, I'm not the Messiah, just so you know. Just so you know, I am not the Messiah. Not the mama, no, not the Messiah, Okay. You know, as I studied the pa this passage this week, I thought to myself, what if John said he was the Messiah? I mean, he probably could have. If you think about it, I mean, think about how much attention and fame he would have received if he had accepted the declaration of Messiah. He had thousands of followers, hundreds of people coming to get baptized, people that were, the word was spreading all over the town. The it was drawing in the religious leaders and everyone that knew about who the Messiah was supposed to be. And he could have taken that moniker and said, yeah, that's me. One of my favorite pastors actually quoted this uh, he, when he was, he did a devotional on this passage and he said this, when the religious leaders came to figure out who he was, he had an opportunity for endorsement and fame. He could get a book deal, make the nightly rounds on the late night talk shows, endorse products for a hefty fee, start his own arena tour. <laughs> he would have been like the one hit wonder of religious leaders, right? Because eventually they would have figured him out. But, but what would have happened if John had taken on that moniker? I mean, it, it could have meant a lot for him. But he would have eventually been fed out. He, he would have eventually been found out. It wouldn't have lasted. I had uh, one, one person tell me a couple weeks ago it would have gone over about as well as a pregnant pole vaulter. <laughs> it wouldn't have lasted or it wouldn't have gone well. Right? They would have figured him out. They would have seen through his guys. His, his falling would have died out like a pop star after going into rehab. His fame wouldn't last long. It always amazed me when I read this passage before that John had the courage to, to not take on those things. But then, it, as we see our pastor friends say here, and I think this is the statement that's going to kind of determine the morning, there's something in John that was different. And I think it was this. John knew who he was. And he knew who, he's not, who he was not. John knew who he was, and he knew who he was not. So he helps the Jews determine that he's not the Messiah, but his, his message is biblical, and he's drawing in thousands of followers. Well, maybe, you know what? Maybe this man is Elijah, 
right? When the Jews ask him uh, uh, this, they're referring to a prophecy that's found in the book of Malachi, chapter, uh, chapter four, verses five and six. This is in the Old Testament. And this prophecy says this, it says, see, I will send the prophet Elijah to you before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. He will return the hearts of the parents to the children and the hearts of their children to their parents or else I will come and strike the land with total destruction. They're referring to this prophecy that we see in the Old Testament. This is a prophecy that's been focused on by the Jews for centuries before Jesus came in. Even still today, uh, those practicing Judaism, those that have denied the existence of Christ, that, that believe in, in, in the same God that we do, those, are, those Jews are still waiting for Elijah today. Did you know that? Even to this day, they still wait for this second coming of Elijah. And they ask him, are, are you Elijah? But John immediately declares, no, I'm, I'm not Elijah. So they continue searching and pulling and trying to extract John's identity. Well, if he's not the Messiah and he's not Elijah, then he's gotta be some kind of a prophet at least. Maybe he's, maybe he's the prophet that Moses spoke about. Maybe he's the prophet that Moses spoke about. That, that's the, the, the prophet in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 15, verse 15. It says, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your fellow Israelites. You must listen to him. If he's not the Messiah, if he's not the prophet Elijah, maybe he's the prophet that Moses spoke about. But once again, John says, no, that's not me. You, that's not me. He never claimed to be the Messiah. He shunned that identity almost before they could question him about it. He never claimed to be Elijah, and he never claimed to be the prophet that Moses spoke about. John knew who he was and who he was not. He knew who he was, and he knew who he was not. So who is he? Well, he was not the Messiah, but he was the one to come before the Messiah. He was not the Messiah, but he was the one to come before. He was not Elijah, but the one to come in the spirit of Elijah. Jesus, literally, the book of Luke chapter, chapter one, not chapter three, excuse me, I apologize there. It should say Luke chapter one, talks about how he came in the spirit of Elijah to announce the coming of Christ. And he was not the prophet that Moses wrote about, but he would be the one to prophesy and prepare the way for Christ. John knew who he was and who he was not. Let me ask you something. How many times have you caught yourself trying to be the Messiah? I mean, not that a bunch of us are trying to say that we're Jesus Christ, okay? Not that we're, we're looking for that. Maybe some people on this earth are claiming to be an, a, another Messiah, but, but, but sometimes we put way too much pressure on ourselves to be our own savior, don't we? We put way too much pressure on ourselves to be our own savior. Not, not so much that we're looking for the glory, but we think that if we have to do it all on our own, we think that, that we don't need God and we don't need others. All we gotta do is this, or we just gotta figure this out. Or if I could just, say, if we could just get here, or if we could just see this happen, or if I could just get us through this rough time or this hard part, or if we could just learn and grow in this area, then we'll be okay. We buy into this lie that if we can just do this and this and this, then everything We'll be fine. Then we'll be accepted. Then we'll have purpose. Then we will have arrived. How often do you catch yourself trying to be maybe not your own Messiah, but someone else's Messiah? How many times have you tried to shove the gospel down someone else's throat? How many times have you tried to, to force someone in one direction? Because you know what's best for them. How many relationships have you burned because you think you're the one that's in control? How much of your life is complete chaos because you've been the one that's tried to take all the glory? 
Or you've been the, the one that, 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 that tries to be the, the strong individual in front of everyone else. How often do you catch yourself trying to be the Messiah? If I just do this, if I can just, if I can just get them here, if I can just get to them in that place, if I could just, I, I just got to work on me and then, and then I'll, once I get this figured out, then everything else will be okay. When in reality, we're just getting in our own way. Or worse yet, we're getting in Jesus' way. You know why I think John, it was so easy for John to stay in his lane, if you will? I think it was so easy, so much easier for John to be confident in who he was and who he was not. Because he under, understood something that so many of us tend to forget or so, so many of us lose sight of. And that was, John knew who he was in relation to Christ. John knew who he was in relation to Christ. Going back to that pastor and his devotional that we were talking about earlier, he writes this, he says, how do we really come to understand ourselves? That question, perhaps more than any other, dominates our thinking as we use personality tests and other tools to discover the mystery that is me. People tried to figure out who John was, and he said that the only way to really truly understand oneself is to first understand Jesus. And that day, like ours, many people made the mistake of looking at themselves way too much and looking at Jesus too little. Think about it. We live in the selfie culture. <laughs> if you want to understand who you are, the first thing you need to understand is who Jesus is. Just as John did. So how do we make Jesus the number one trending topic in our lives? We step aside for the king. We step aside for the king. We get out of his way and we get out of our own way. You see, we live in a culture that calls us to just be ourselves and just worry about making ourselves happy and it's about self-love and self-preservation and self-help. I kid you not, last year I, heard some, I saw someone put a post on social media that said, does anybody know about any Christian self-help books? And I said, there's no such oxymoron in the entire planet that's beyond that. <laughs> we fool ourselves into thinking that we have to be our own Messiah. Or maybe we fool ourselves into thinking that someone else needs to be our Messiah. I don't, I don't know where you're at. But we buy into this culture of lies that says, if we could just take care of us, if I could just take care of me. And we begin to place our identity in a lot of things other than God, don't we? We begin to place our identity in so many other things, whether it be our relationships or our careers or material possessions or sexuality or social media highlights or relationships. I don't know what it is for you, but I'm telling you this morning, you're not gonna figure you out until you figure him out. at least where you're at in relation to him. You see, when we step aside for the king, when we get out of our own way and his, when we look at who we are in relation to who he is and, and what it is that he's done for us, it allows Jesus to do what only he can do. Not that he needs our permission, God is sovereign. God rules over everything. He created the universe. He is the master of creation. Everything that has breath has breath and life because of him, amen? He doesn't need our permission, but he's asking for something here. He's asking for submission. 
Jesus isn't gonna force his way on us. This is why I make it a point not to shove the gospel down people's throats or beat them over the head with the Bible because I know that it's not gonna matter what I do or say outside of the Holy Spirit working in me. My job is just to make sure that Jesus is the number one trending topic in my life and that that declares the love of Christ every single day and I just love people as hard as I can. I'm actually gonna share this at the family meeting this afternoon. This, this last year was rough for Pastor Rob and God brought me to a point in January where he said, Rob, stop worrying about the numbers, stop worrying about attendance, stop worrying about this, stop worrying about that. Start loving people. Start caring for people because you've lost sight of that. We gotta step aside for the king. We've gotta step aside for the king. Jesus isn't gonna force his ways on us. That would make us slaves, not his children. And Jesus isn't looking for slaves. He's looking for a relationship. He's looking for submission in response to his love. He's looking for surrender. Because when he gets all of those things, then he can do what only he can do. If you read on in the passage, it says this, the next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, look, who takes away the sin of the world. Do you realize how powerful that statement is? This is the one I meant when I said, a man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but the reason I came baptizing with water was that he might be revealed to Israel. Then John gave his testimony. I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. And I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, the man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I have seen and testified that this is God's chosen one. And when John stepped out of the way, Jesus' ministry took off. And that ministry would continue on for thousands of years. It would survive mass genocide and massacre. It would survive Caesar, who was proclaimed as the son of God during his time during the Roman Empire. Jesus' ministry would survive Nero, the man who used Christians and burn them to light his garden. Jesus' ministry would take the Roman Empire who proclaimed Caesar as the son of God to, to, to come to a point where they realize, no, Jesus is the son of God. In a Roman Empire that despised the Jews and for some time despised the Christians, became king. They eventually stepped aside and Jesus' ministry would continue on. And, and that ministry has continued on today. We're sitting here today because John stepped aside. And my question to you this morning is, where do you need to step aside? Where do you need to get out of your own way? Where are you struggling to finally give Jesus your everything? I think there's some of you here today that, that, that know that, 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 that this is what you should have done a long time ago and you just haven't done it yet. I don't know what the fear is. I don't know what the trepidation is. I don't know what's keeping you from it. But I, and, and I'm not saying it's gonna be all rainbows and butterflies when you do it, but I promise you this, man, you'll have purpose. Man, you'll have peace that transcends all understanding as scripture promises. Man, you'll, you'll come to realize that, that all those other things weren't working for a reason and that's because he's the only reason to walk on this earth, amen? 
So this is what I want to do. First service, we didn't do this, but I'm gonna, I, I want to do this this service. Um, I don't know what your situation is, but I, I think there are some of you here today that would say, man, I, I should have stepped aside a long time ago. I know that I've been afraid to do it, but, but man, now, now's the stinking time. I'm just going to give it to Jesus and, and I'm going to give him a shot and I'm, we're going to see what happens. I'm going to submit to my king. I'm going to step aside. And, and what I want you to do this morning, if that's you, is, is, is I want you to come to the altars and I literally want you to get on, on your knees before your king. Maybe it's something, just a small situation in your life that you've just been having all kinds of chaos and turmoil with. I don't, I don't know what it is. Maybe it's, hey, I need to give Jesus my life for the very first time. I, I don't know what it is, but, but the Bible says that if you repent of your sins, if you ask for forgiveness of your sins, you can be given eternal life and peace that transcends all understanding and everything that we know in this world. So where do you need to step aside? Justin's going to sing. Sing the whole thing, man. Go at it. And, uh, if you feel led, we want you to come forward and get on your knees. There's nothing, there's nothing more powerful than getting on your knees before Jesus. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, I pray for courage. I pray for your spirit to move. I pray for chains to be broken this morning. I pray that people would be able to, to, to finally run through walls and barriers that are keeping us from you. I pray for empires to be turned upside down in this community. I pray for you to move in a way that is unexplainable. God, give us the courage to surrender now. It's in the name of your son, Jesus, we pray.